I had dreamed many times in my dreams I was in front of the White House. Well, I was out in front of the White House 20 to 22 hours a day for 18 years. When I started doing this vigil in 1981, uh, India, Pakistan, North Korea, possibly Iran, didn't have nuclear weapons. World War III is around the corner. Unless people take over, we up or perish. No other way. And if we don't stop, it's going to be a nuclear holocaust. Nuclear holocaust. I turned on the TV trying to find a movie, and uh, there was this drama taking place down by the White House at the Washington Monument. About 9.20, a call came in to our communication control center that stated a gentleman had drove a, a truck up to the base of Monument. It was a panel truck, like you'd rent from uh, a rental, you know, a U-Haul company or something like that. He approached a U.S. Park police officer, told him that he had about a thousand pounds of dynamite. And he also handed the officer uh, documentation of his demands. He said that he was going to blow up the Washington Monument if uh, the media didn't devote, I, I forget whether it was 60 or 70 percent of its airtime to the issue of nuclear weapons. It says, as an act of sanity, ban nuclear weapons or have a nice doomsday. They had the whole thing surrounded with guys with guns. He's got this black outfit on, right? With a black helmet, with a visor. And he had in his hands a remote control. And he told them that, uh, it was a dead man switch, and if they shot him, then the thing was going to go off. Police took the threat seriously, warning that anyone within 2,400 feet of the monument would be in danger. At the White House, the Secret Service feared that windows facing the monument could be blown out by an explosion. Some of the missiles could uh, actually, uh, I was advised, could strike the White House. So, uh, based on that uh, contingency, I requested the Secret Service uh, to move the president. The president was told to move out of the Oval Office. Instead of the state dining room, Ronald Reagan's luncheon was moved to a marble hallway with no windows facing the monument. Mr. Reagan's other meetings were moved to other rooms, and the first lady was told to stay away from windows in the residence. We had to evacuate, I think it was over 20 some thousand people the Smithsonian and other buildings. Police then said they believed that in addition to this man in the blue suit, another man is inside the van. A check of the van's license plate reveals it belongs to 66-year-old Norman Mayer. First, we didn't know who we were dealing with. And the tag number came back and we suspected it could be Mayer. But we didn't know because he had this uh, uniform on and we could tell it was an active individual. He looked like a, a spaceman from Mars or somewhere. So we really didn't know for exactly who we had. We didn't know it was Norman David Mayer. 
If the man is Norman Mayer of Miami, his demands for an end to nuclear weapons are not new to him. People in Miami who knew Mayer said that was his number one priority. He, of course, was part of this group of, of folks who had been protesting outside the White House. He spent much of his day outside the White House gates, distributing leaflets protesting nuclear weapons. Anti-nuclear literature like this flyer was Mayer's real interest, acquaintances say. Calling politicians genocidalist, Mayer warned that the survival of the world depends on the elimination of nuclear weapons. He, he built these signs. Well, he didn't build them himself. He had them professionally done. And he used to come with his van every morning, precisely, like, I don't know, 7.30, take the signs out of his van, put them on the White House sidewalk. I would watch him for him, and uh, he'd sit there and talk to people. His, his, his big idea was that he would offer $10,000 to anyone who could prove that nuclear weapons deterred nuclear war. Um, I know, I'm, I don't even think he had $10,000, but he had a point. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was hard to prove that nuclear weapons could deter nuclear war, even though a lot of people believe that, that they, they do. But you have to sort of put yourself back in time. I mean, this is the Cold War. This is the beginning of the Reagan administration. Nuclear weapons were a uh, ever-present issue and a threat. I would say that if you interviewed almost everyone in the House and Senate, they don't know that the threat of nuclear war is greater now than ever before. The stockpile stewardship and maintenance program is a euphemism for making more nuclear weapons. Dr. Helen Caldicott has been called one of the most influential women of the 20th century. President Clinton wanted to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty ratified by the US Senate. And so he had a big problem, he had a sort of big monkey on his shoulder, and that were the nuclear weapons labs, Los Alamos, Sandia and Lawrence Livermore. And they run the whole show. They're extraordinarily powerful. So he said to them, look, if you'll let the Senate ratify the CTBT, I'll give you some money for, quotes, the Stockpile Stewardship and Maintenance Program, SS&M. However, it's not really for that. It's really for testing nuclear weapons, both sub-critical testing, testing them by huge supercomputers. Um, it's to manufacture new nuclear weapons of smaller variety and size, and it's such great fun. I think that terrorism and the fight against, quotes, terrorism, which is a very nebulous thing, is a case of manic denial. The only two rogue nations in the world are Russia and America. Of the 30,000 nuclear weapons in the world, Russia and America own 97%. QED. Say no more. How dare they go around with a telescope or a microscope? In the days before and just after Norman Mayer's mad stand at the Washington Monument, a small band of complete strangers converged on D.C. in Lafayette Park, just opposite the White House. Like the legions of demonstrators before them, they gravitated toward the nation's capital, their fates becoming inextricably intertwined. Each of these strangers wandered for years across the face of the planet, incessantly moving from place to place. But regardless of the various currents and eddies which brought them to rest here, for over 25 years, three of these strangers, influenced in part by Norman Mayer and his desperate act, would hold a constant, all-weather, round-the-clock, anti-nuclear vigil. Thank you. Thank you. You have to use diplomacy and dialogue with your own people. It's your families. Thank you. Bye. 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 
these three vigilers have, like some later-day oracles of destruction, abandoned most worldly possessions and creature comforts in order to raise the alarm to anyone passing by about the threat of nuclear annihilation. But all of this has come at great personal cost to the vigilers. These three vigilers have had to endure harsh winter weather, police brutality, a string of federal court battles, and their own internal struggles in order to maintain one of the longest vigils of any kind on the planet, the impact of which has been felt both culturally and politically in DC and around the world. Norman David Mayer, later to be called Washington's first terrorist because of his stand at the Washington Monument, lived all of his life as an anchorless wanderer with no connection or allegiance to any person or place. Norman was born in the sweeping border town of El Paso, Texas on March 31, 1916. He and his brother Aubrey were orphaned when Norman was only seven years old and were placed in a Jewish children's home in New Orleans. Like many orphans of the time, there was not much emphasis given to his education, and he was shuffled off to a local trade school where he learned the practical skill of tool and die making. In 1930, at the age of 14, Norman left New Orleans and began a long life of incessant wandering. Along the way, he picked up odd jobs here and there, first at a rubber mill in Denver, then a gold mine in Nome, Alaska. In 1944, while living in Los Angeles, he was drafted into the United States Navy. And by late 1945, Norman was honorably discharged from the Navy as a fireman first class. From the early 1950s to the late 1960s, Norman worked throughout Florida and the Caribbean in hotels as a general handyman. For years, he washed ashore like driftwood into a variety of tropical paradises from Puerto Rico then to the Virgin Islands and St. Thomas, and finally to Jamaica, never staying in one place long enough to put down roots. In the late 1960s, Norman made another giant geographic leap from the Caribbean, and his incessant wandering landed him, this time, in the Western Pacific. There, from 1969 until 1970, he worked for two U.S. military contractors as a helicopter mechanic in Vietnam. Shortly after his stint in Vietnam, in 1971, Norman took a job on an oil rig in Brunei, where he injured himself in a serious accident. After recuperating in Singapore, he then decided to travel across Asia and India, and eventually ended up in the Seychelles Islands. In the Seychelles, like some modern-day Robinson Crusoe, Norman lived on a beach in a thatched hut for four years until his money ran out, and he decided to return to the U.S. On his way back to the States, and short on cash as he was, Norman decided to make a little business deal with a man in Thailand. The Thai businessman, however, notified the Hong Kong police of their arrangement, and Norman was arrested at the airport in possession of 44 pounds of marijuana. Norman then spent the next 15 months in a Hong Kong prison from 1977 to 1978. While he was in prison, he availed himself of the prison's library studied British common law, and a few months later, acting as his own attorney, his original conviction was overturned on an illegal search and seizure technicality. He was then deported back to the U.S., 
the judge at the time telling him that he should use his obvious intelligence for more productive ends. Repatriated into the U.S., he headed back to Florida, where he began working again, as he had in the 1950s and 60s, as a hotel handyman. Mayer worked odd jobs at several Miami Beach hotels. His acquaintances considered his anti-nuclear passion a bit strange. He brought some letters in here and uh, passed them around to us, and uh, I took a fast glance at it and wake my eye at one of the other guys and just said he was off his rocker. Almost everyone who knew Mayer described him as a loner who wore a ponytail and worked odd maintenance jobs at beach hotels before quitting or getting fired. Jobless and wandering yet again, Norman began handing out anti-nuclear literature on university campuses in Florida. Mayer took out anti-nuclear ads in university newspapers and was arrested twice in 1979 for distributing literature on college campuses without permission. After being arrested several times on campuses around the state, Norman finally headed north in April of 1982. Police and FBI agents visited a Miami Beach apartment where a man named Norman Mayer lived on and off during the past few years. But according to the building's owner, the 66-year-old man, seen here in a 1957 photograph, left Miami Beach in April, driving a truck that looked like the one parked next to the Washington Monument. Before he left, Mayer bought parts for his truck from this store located near his apartment. He said, I'm preparing this truck to live in the truck because I expect to travel all over the United States, you know, because I'm expecting a nuclear war and I want to pre be prepared to survive. He lined it with steel to make sure that it would withstand uh, a nuclear blast. And he, as far as I remember, he told me that he would survive a year longer than anybody else. In May of 1982, he attempted to buy dynamite from an explosives dealer in Hazard, Kentucky. Soon after, Norman arrived in Washington, D.C., where he began showing up at the offices of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. At the Carnegie Endowment, Norman met George Stephanopoulos, a 21-year-old intern and recent university graduate trying to break into politics. I came down to Washington to work at a think tank called the Arms Control Association, which was an offshoot of the Carnegie Endowment. And uh, its purpose was to advance uh, the cause of nuclear arms control, which was something that Norman uh, was obviously interested in as well. He looked to me to be in his late 60s, early 70s, and he had this really deep tan. But the tan that was so deep, it almost made you look a little unhealthy. Um, and he would wear a, a, a baseball cap and sunglasses and a nylon windbreaker. And he would make me think of, um, I used to caddy when I was uh, a kid. And he just seemed like a caddy master at a country club, you know, kind of gone to seed, but he, he just had that air. He was a very friendly guy, very talkative. He wanted to keep your distance because he knew there was something a little off about him, but he, he was very sweet. And since his cause was nuclear arms control, he would, he would often come into our offices. And since I was the junior person, I was delegated to meet with him. And so, you know, I would sit down with him and I would listen to him for a little while and I would give him a sandwich if he had one left over from one of our lunches. Um, and then just, you know, sort of usher him on his way. It was also in D.C. where Norman was to meet two fellow wanderers and kindred spirits in front of the White House gates. I met him about a year after I, I started sitting there, Norman came to town one day. I was, uh, I was thinking about starving myself to death, actually. I, I was into about day 62 or so of a hunger strike. He came around and he gave me a rose. And he said, what you're doing is very commendable, shows uh, understanding, but it's a waste of time because if you starve yourself to death, they're just going to write you off as a lunatic and uh, you're not going to get anything. And he said, uh, if you stop your fast, I have a plan and I'll tell you about it. He bought me some yogurt and uh, I think some fruit juice and I took it. And he said, uh, okay. He said, my plan is to take out some of these icons. So what do you mean icons? 
He said, some of these monuments, I want, I want to take out a monument, I want to blow it up. I said, uh, well, I'll do it with you, provided that you can uh, guarantee me that nobody will be hurt except for you and me. He said, well, that's not possible. It's not possible, I can guarantee that. And I said, well, uh, then I don't think it's a good idea. I think that people have a tendency to look at a long-haired guy like that and say, what the hell is he going to do anyway? My brother could be chairman of the board of General Motors. I'm telling you, whatever my brother went out to achieve, he would achieve, period. And it just so happens that he's chose this venue uh, to live his life and to chase his dreams. I think that that visual is more important to him than, uh, than breathing. Both my brother and I had a childhood uh, that I guess you might call a lower middle class American situation. We, uh, we grew up in a very small, unpretentious house. When he was very young, he was a brilliant child and primarily was in honor classes all through school. Not because he worked hard, but just because it came so easy to him. My mother and father were divorced uh, when I believe my brother was about five and I was about three. There was nothing typical about his adolescent rebellion. He was a bad guy. If you had a problem with him, he'd, he'd beat you up. He got involved with uh, maybe a wrong crowd, and just as is his want, whenever he would get involved with a crowd, he would kind of assume a leadership position. This resulted in his incarceration uh, for a number of years. Where he was incarcerated, it was my understanding that one person in the history, the 100-year history, of that institution had maxed their sentence out. My brother was number two. We're talking about an individual whose threshold of pain differs from certainly from mine, I, I, I dare say probably from yours as well. If you were told that you were gonna be put in solitary confinement, you would do just about whatever it is to avoid being put in solitary confinement. He said to me, you know, 30 days, he said, I can stand on my head in the closet for 30 days, and he could. After his period of incarceration, then came kind of the epiphany, and he kind of took it upon himself to learn, learn what is happening, what has happened in the world, reading the holy books of the world, not just the Bible, in their own language, learning the language by himself. Again, when he, when he was young, he, he, was, uh, he was different. Uh, and you know, what you see today, a guy who literally is the ultimate, and if you slapped him in the face, he would turn the other cheek as until you couldn't slap anymore. Uh, it's such a, a metamorphosis from that standpoint, it's unbelievable. I wound up in New Mexico, was married to a woman who was uh, quite attractive, great housekeeper. I believe she was a systems analyst or some high-ranking computer person, uh, obviously with her job, a bright woman. We had a house totally paid for, two cars, pickup truck. One day I was reading the Bible, um, Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, the birds in the air neither sow nor reap, yet the Father provides for them. The lilies in the field neither spin nor weave, yet they are more gloriously arrayed than Solomon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for what you will eat, drink, or put on. Seek first the things of the kingdom of heaven, and all else you need will be added unto you. Take no thought for tomorrow, for the evils of today are sufficient. And I said to myself, well, gee, if what Jesus is saying here is true, then the way I'm living is false, because all my thoughts are about tomorrow. Turning over my inventory, my bank account, my insurance policies, all these things. And I never think about these things that I'm seeing on the television now, which are actually the evils of today. But then I said to myself, well, you gotta be practical. I mean, if you don't think about tomorrow, how are you gonna get food and clothes? Being the kind of skeptical person that I am, I decided to put it to a test. And that's why I walked across North Africa without any money. I chose North Africa because the propaganda machine was telling me what cruel and bloodthirsty camel raping people the uh, Arabs were. And I figured, well, that's a hostile climate, so this will be an acid test. Donna, my wife in New Mexico, didn't handle uh, my decision to do this very well. 
uh, I wanted her to go with me. He was shocked that she would say no, that she wasn't coming on this journey with him, which, you know, he was going to find all the secrets of, you know, religion and civilization and where we came from and uh, what was fair and what wasn't. You know, I thought she loved me and would follow me, but she didn't, so I was a little bummed. I did it. I, I went across North Africa, didn't ask anybody for anything. All that I carried with me on this was a blanket. And it took me six months to make the trip. And during the six months, I don't think I spent more than six weeks sleeping outside with my blanket. All the time, people would be stopping me and saying, where are you going? I'm going to Cairo. Cairo, blah, 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 that's a long way. Come to my house, have dinner. Uh, and these are poor people. Uh, and uh, they're sharing with me the little that they have. It, it, just, it just changed my mind about humanity and, 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 and the United States. And, uh, because I could see firsthand the effects that the United States economic policies were having on people in other parts of the world. And uh, I decided I didn't want to be part of it anymore. Having traveled all the way from Casablanca, Thomas finally arrived in Cairo, nearly penniless. But even without money, he didn't lack for accommodations. For the first week of his stay in Cairo, the roof over his head was none other than the Great Pyramid itself. To reserve his large stony hotel suite, around closing time, Thomas would purchase a cheap ticket to enter the pyramid and then hide himself away in a small side passage. When the gates of the pyramid were closed and locked and the lights were turned off, Thomas would make his way in the inky blackness to the main burial chamber where he would sleep the night away in the king's giant stone sarcophagus. Setting his eyes on Jerusalem, Thomas again pulled up stakes and made his way to the Suez Canal Zone on foot. At the canal zone, he attempted to swim across to the then Israeli-controlled Sinai Peninsula, where he intended to walk to Jerusalem. Before making much progress in his swim, however, he was shot at by an Egyptian patrol. And I start trying to swim away, right? Well, I'm trying to stay on the water. But every time I pop my head up, they shoot at me a bit. I figure either I'm going to die or I'm going to give up. So I gave up. Thomas was immediately taken into custody and thrown into prison. While in prison, Thomas befriended several Palestinians who had been in prison merely for not having a country to return to. I figured, well, gee, this isn't really fair, you know. I mean, I'm an American because I got this passport, and so I can get out of here. But these guys, because they don't have any passport, they can't get out of here. And so that's not really equal. That's not fair. And so uh, I, I refused to deal with the American embassy at all. After Thomas had spent a year in prison in solidarity with the Palestinians, the Egyptian government released him with the stipulation that he leave the country immediately, but not through the canal zone. Back on the street, Thomas headed back to the Suez Canal Zone and was successful in his second effort to swim across to the Sinai Peninsula. Wet and exhausted from his swim, Thomas carried on and went through the glaring heat of the Sinai Desert on foot. And I got to Israel and then I got arrested in Israel for uh, entering the country illegally. And, and that quite surprised me because I thought that, you know, all the money the United States gives Israel, I, you know, I, I can just walk in, you know. I, but no, they arrested me. The deal I made with the Israelis was that I was on a pilgrimage and I just wanted to visit a few places, you know, like Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And they said, okay, you, you can stay in the country for a month. So I went to all these places and uh, I left the country. After some not so minor detours through parts of the Middle East and Europe, Thomas arrived in England, where realizing that his wife no longer wanted him to return, and having observed what he believed to be the hypocrisy of US foreign policy firsthand, he decided not to return to the U.S. So I took out my little wallet with all my papers, all my IDs and driver's licenses and all that crap, and I threw them in this lake. And I declared that I was a stateless person, 
and that I was never going to return to the United States. So I, I decided to go back to Jerusalem, sit outside the uh, Damascus Gate, and do essentially what I'm doing here in the park. Well, to implement this plan, I headed back down to Dover. And I was trying to figure out how to get across the channel. A Bobby comes up to me and says, uh, let me see some identification. Well, I had just thrown all my identification in the park lake, so I didn't have any identification. And I told him that. He said, well, then you're going to have to come with me. They took me down to the lockup that they had at the Dover port. Then they started slapping me around and punching me and stuff, and so they sentenced me to 90 days in jail for overstaying a visa. A few weeks later, I get a visit from the American consul, and he says, the uh, British Home Office wants you deported to the United States. Is there anything we can do for you? I said, yeah, you can tell them that you can't deport me to the United States. Uh, you know, if there's such a thing as freedom, it's at least the ability for a person to decide who or what he wants to be. I said, well, let me ask you this. Is there any law that says I can't throw my passport away? He said, no. I said, is there any law that says I have to be an American citizen? He said, no. I said, is there any law that says you can force me to enter the United States against my will? Well, legally, we can't do that, he said, stressing the legally part. Well, some months later, these five cops came up and uh, took me out to Heathrow Airport. The lead cop takes a five-pound note, sticks it in my pocket, says, have a drink on Her Majesty's government. I got, I got on the plane, and they're all standing around the door to make sure I don't get off. Right? So I went to the back of the plane, where the stewardesses are preparing in-flight in meals and stuff, and there's an escape hatch there, you know, with one of those uh, wheel-type deals on it to open it up. So I just opened it up. Uh, I noticed the stewardess was looking at me pretty peculiarly. And I said, tally-ho, and I jumped out the plane. Uh, that's a pretty good jump, you know, that's like 20 feet or something. So I wind up flat on my back on the tarmac, and I see the stewardess stick her head out the window, and she's shaking her head. And then she just closed the door, and I went back in through the exit, and thereby circumvented customs and got scot-free away. So, thanks to the fact that I had this five-pound note in my pocket, I could take the tube back into London. Thomas headed to the U.S. Embassy where he made a brief, unsuccessful attempt to speak with the U.S. Consul about renouncing his citizenship. He goes, honest to God, like he's calling the head waiter or something, you know? And Marines come over, pick me up, carry me out, <clears throat> hold me on the steps of the embassy. <laughs> British police come up, Phew, back to jail again. A couple of weeks later, they come down, they take me back out to Heathrow. This time I got two cops, one sitting on either side of me. We landed in New York. Everybody's getting off the plane, and I'm not moving, of course. And they start looking at one another. Uh, Mr. Thomas, we're in the United States, we're in New York, it's time to get off the plane. I said, look, I told you I didn't want to come here. I'm not getting off. And they finally managed to get in touch with the airport security. And a whole gang of these thugs come on the plane, right? Oh, why don't you want to get off the plane? This is a nice country. We got Disneyland here and everything. I said, well, don't take it personally. It's nothing against you or your country. It's just that I want to be someplace else. This isn't on my agenda. And, uh, I'm not getting off the plane. He said, well, I don't know anything about that, but you get the fuck off this plane. They actually physically picked me up, carried me off the plane. My experience at the airport pretty much convinced me that this country was no different than the Soviet Union, essentially. And I felt, at that time, that the greatest threat facing humanity was nuclear weapons. So I, I decided then to return to uh, D.C. Then I realized that there was a lot of traffic going through Lafayette Park, and so I figured, well, I'll just sit down here and, until uh, 
I can think of something better to do. While Thomas was thinking of something better to do, he began what would become the longest running public protest against U.S. foreign policy in the nation's history. And along the way, Thomas met others who would share his journey. So I never dreamed being one day up in here in front of the White House. But uh, something happened to me that drove me to stay here. I call this, what you call the White House, I call it the head, the head of the octopus. And the tentacles all over the world. Well, I came here from New York in the 70s. Thomas was there. He had two signs protesting nuclear, and I was having signs for my cause, and we were arrested. So when I get out of jail, he told me, he says, well, since we are uh, working for the same cause, peace and justice, we make a team. And that's how I met Thomas. Concepcion Pichotto, known simply as Connie to most, was like Norman Mayer, an orphan from an early age. Well, I was born in Spain. I never had a sister, so brothers. Yeah, I was very young when I came into the United States back in 1960. I live in New York. At uh, the time, I work at the um, Pavilion of Spain, at the uh, New York Welfare. When the Fed was finished in 19. In 65, I worked at the UN for a little while, and I moved to the embassy of Spain to the commercial office in New York, where I worked for nine years there. On October 29th, 1966, Connie married an Italian man, and the happy couple moved into a relatively modern and spacious Brooklyn apartment. Shortly after their marriage, Connie noticed that her husband was overly friendly with a much older Italian woman who had recently moved to New York. This older woman seemed to enjoy interfering in their marriage and began ridiculing Connie for her inability to have children. When Connie tired of the old woman's meddling, she confronted her husband. After a violent outburst, her husband related a bizarre story. When he was 19, he told Connie, he had had an affair with this older woman, an Italian baroness and he lived with her until he left for the States. But he promised Connie their relationship was now nothing more than between a mother and a son. But still very useful. Please. <laughs> no, no. In an effort to salvage an already shaky marriage, Connie agreed to her husband's suggestion that they adopt a child. After several efforts in the United States, the troubled couple flew to Argentina and soon adopted young Olga. But their newfound bliss was short-lived, however, when Connie began feeling ill. She consulted several doctors, one of whom asked if she was ever exposed to industrial chemicals, to which she responded, no. Connie's condition continued to worsen as her mysterious illness bore down on her. Then one night she woke up to find her husband standing over her in the dark, rubbing her head. He said he was just covering her with a blanket. Connie became more and more suspicious that something was amiss, especially when she discovered her husband had recently changed their insurance policy. Finally, one night, Connie confronted them both, accusing them of attempting to kill her, and her husband struck her violently on the side of the head, breaking her eardrum. The police were called, and Connie was taken to the hospital. Then her husband and the Baroness attempted to have her committed to the psych ward of the hospital. But when the doctors examined her, they found nothing psychologically wrong. They had no recourse but to release her. Enraged that Connie should be released, her husband shouted at her with an icy stare and told her, you're a dead woman. A short time later, her husband made off with the entire contents of Connie's safe deposit box and disappeared with their daughter. Connie, who had stopped working when their daughter came into their life, was now destitute and quickly became homeless. She then made several attempts through legal representation to find her daughter and regain custody, but in vain. In one last effort to find her daughter, Olga, she went to Washington, D.C. to try and petition her congressperson. Despondent and penniless, Connie started wandering the streets of D.C. There in front of the White House gates, she met Norman and Thomas. Norman came in the summer 1982. At that time, Thomas was having a hunger strike. Norman started approaching us and talked to us. 
giving me a penny for each flyer that I would pass out. And uh, that's how we met Norman. I had dreamed many times. In my dreams, I was in front of the White House. In fact, uh, during my first marriage, I tried to convince my husband to move to Washington, D.C., because I felt like this was where I needed to be. One day during a Minnesota snowstorm, I turned on the TV trying to find a movie, and there was this drama taking place down by the White House at the Washington Monument. And he had on a helmet, and he was stalking around this big van. And, and I sat there enthralled with tears falling down my face because I was, I was thinking, well, I agree with you, I agree with you, but this is such a stupid thing to do. That was really what made me move to Washington, D.C., was seeing that event. It really changed my life. I was very blessed to have been raised in California by a couple of very creative people. My father was an artist, and my mother was an artist homemaker. She had a very unusual um, background. But mainly, the thing that made her so different was her grandmother and her father. My grandmother was an actress and an opera singer and a model in Paris of high fashion. So she told stories about walking down the street with a boa constrictor around her neck or a pan black panther on a chain, showing off these clothes and stuff. And, and she had umpteen zillion bows, as she called them. Whenever I saw her, I was the center of the universe, and she was always teaching me something. She lived in Hollywood, and she had a lot of actor friends, and so I'd get to meet all these people. My folks split when I was 17, and my mother, she was worried that I might start being a, a hippie or something. And so when she and my dad broke up, we went back to the mountains of North Carolina, and then I went to college. I met this lovely farm boy from North Carolina and uh, we got married. She was a stay-at-home mom and she was kind of um, just like everybody else's mother. She was very ultra-conservative, you know, she drove the Mercedes and, you know, it was just a very different time. He was a very, very nice man, but we didn't see life the same way, and he certainly wasn't as adventurous as I was. And so I decided to try to be a single mother. Then we moved to Minnesota, where my mother was. I was working as the assistant to the CEO of a large architectural engineering firm, and I had a good life. Shortly thereafter, I got this tearful phone call from my daughter who said that she and her stepmother had had a terrible fight and she was going to quit school and go to work and move out of the house. And she was a senior in high school. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Be patient. you got to get your degree. And, but uh, I'll move to Washington, D.C., and you can come live with me there. And so that's what we did. Then um, she kind of started writing and doing some things that for herself and started finding herself and um, she was a little weird. And so I was going around the city talking to people and um, bringing them food and, and, try, and trying to understand their stories because I was writing this play in which the main character was a man who had a small pension who instead of living in a house he lived on the streets and shared what he had and dispensed wisdom to people who were in trouble and helped them get off the streets. And I was walking through Lafayette Square from my job, which was at the National Wildlife Federation. Again, I was assistant to the CEO there. Concepcion was at the signs. She was dressed in a ski suit. It was March 1984. So I stopped to talk to her and I asked her if she did this alone. I was amazed and she said, no, I have a friend. He's a philosopher. His name is Thomas. Well, m my main character was a philosopher, and so I had to come back and meet this fellow Thomas. And uh, I came back the next day. I think we met the day before my birthday, if I recall. And the minute I saw him, I recognized him. I had dreamed his face. 
And the minute I heard him talk, I, I recognized him because I had dreamed his voice and his words since I was a child. And Thomas convinced me that you can live without money, which was a radical idea. I'd been enslaved to money all my life, you know, all my adult life anyway. And I had decided that I was going to reduce my income below the poverty level, hopefully doing something creative so that I could stop being a taxpayer and stop contributing to the madness. I was, uh, I was very moved by what they were doing. I was moved by the, by the realization that it could be done. And I was moved by my need to make the world a better place. I, as a mother, you know, I've, I've always, always hated nuclear weapons. Always, from the time I first saw photographs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Life magazine when I was five years old. And I was, of course, in love with Thomas. Ellen and I had these marathon conversations, and we just realized that uh, we were kind of like soulmates. Thomas wrote to me, you can join me in my world, but I can't join you in yours. I thought, well, okay, let's, let's see. And I went out and spent a weekend in the park with them. And uh, I came back and I had made up my mind. I was, and I went and I quit my job. Over the course of several months, she started spending more and more time out there. And, and um, you know, it got kind of weird. When your mom tells you that she dumpster dives and she, you know, to, to eat food and, and that, you know, she has an office where she can go and take a shower every now and then, but she sleeps in the street and she's getting arrested for sleeping in trees, you know, I mean, it's kind of uncomfortable. I was teased. I remember talking about how my mother um, tested at a genius level and, uh, and they called my mother the genius in the park. <laughs> And they used to give me a lot of trash about it. So it was, it was just kind of strange. And then she married Thomas. Um, and that was kind of different because I, I boycotted the wedding. I swore I would never get involved with a woman again unless she was ready to cross the desert with me But uh, after my experience with Donna. But I figure Ellen, Ellen, Ellen had a well-paying job and she had a place up on Capitol Hill, and she quit it. And moved out on the street with me and lived on the street for seven years. I was out in front of the White House 20 to 22 hours a day for 18 years. I was ready, I was ripe, you know. I, I tried on all of society's shoulds and shouldn'ts and didn't like any of them, and, and so I decided to make this move, and I have not regretted it, not once. Well, he's still there in his black motorcycle helmet and snowmobile suit, threatening to blow up the Washington Monument with a thousand pounds of dynamite. The mysterious man started the siege to demand a ban on nuclear war. It, it sort of gradually escalated. Uh, you know, at first it seemed to be just a curious police situation. Streets were sealed off and tourists watched as the man in the blue snowsuit paced and at times sat on the monument fence next to the van. He may be a 66-year-old Miami man, but no one is sure. And they don't know if his truck is really loaded with dynamite or if he's bluffing. Downtown Washington is paralyzed as the nation watches on television. It was like when Reagan was shot. They let school out early and it was just looping on TV over and over again. I, I actually came back from lunch and I'll never forget this. My boss, Bill Kincaid, walked to me, up to me and said, your friend is trying to take over the Washington Monument. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And then we turned on the TV and there was Norman Mayer dressed up in a space suit. By 10.30, the area was evacuated but not everyone was able to get out. Eight people are trapped inside the monument, hostages in a bizarre twist of fate. Chief Lynn Herring of the National Park Police is the man calling the shots. My main concern and thought was, oh my God, 
these people in the monument, you know, what a place to be with uh, that guy having them as a hostage with all of those explosives. One of them, Tracy Williams, is a park ranger working at the monument. She makes her way to a telephone and calls for help. We have a telephone at the base and she was able to communicate with, the, with them. And they were instructed to go at the very top of the monument. Clerk typist just said really loud, just yelled, Tracy, it's really bad. Run upstairs, hurry up, run. So I took a deep breath because I was thinking I have to get this key in the keyhole without shaking. Tracy runs up the monument steps, adrenaline pumping as she leads the others up 897 steps, 555 feet to relative safety at the top of the monument. At the base, police take up positions. I naturally started gaining all of the expertise that I would need, so I got the uh, SAC for the Washington Field Office, FBI, the uh, Secret Service, uh, our uh, ATF, explosive expert, and uh, also a requested uh, behavioral science uh, group from uh, Quantico. And as soon as we could identify the person, for them to try to develop a psychological profile for me. First, when we sent our first negotiating team up, it was actually an FBI agent and a U.S. Park Police officer dressed in civilian clothes. And Norman Mayer had uh, kind of an in innate uh, quality or intuition, but for some reason, he just didn't feel comfortable. He probably felt they were connected to the police. So he refused to negotiate to even talk to them. They got about three-fourths of the way up there and he motioned for them to go back or he was kind of motioned that he'd set off the explosives. While Herring plots his next move, the hostages wait. To ease their fear, the hostages try to enjoy the view, thumbing through guidebooks, matching photos with the skyline below. Meanwhile, Mayor agrees to speak with a reporter. He wants someone single, without dependents. Fueling speculation, the truck may actually blow up. I remember it was, a, it was a chilly day, and I was a little bit under the weather, and I called my boss and I said, I'm gonna come in just a little bit late. And, and he said, well, you know, on your way in, why don't you swing by? There's some sort of a uh, situation going on downtown uh, near the Washington Monument didn't know much about it or anything, so I just drove right downtown and just parked right on Constitution Avenue there and just walked over and, uh, you know, started asking questions to cover the story. We tried to find some news reporter uh, that would volunteer in this very serious situation with the hostage still in the monument that would approach Norman Mayer and try to negotiate. I was single at the time and I... I, of course, volunteered because I covered local news in Washington. The police knew who I was. So we brought Steve in. We talked to him with our hostage negotiators. We gave him the do's and don'ts of negotiation. So he took probably a five or 10 minute orientation program to how to be a, a professional negotiator in a hostage situation. Eventually, Associated Press reporter Steve Camerow was allowed to walk up. I walked up to the monument and, uh, and talked to Norman Mayer. I once asked Carl Sagan, did he think that there, were, there was life anywhere else in the universe? And he said, no, he said, if any life had evolved to where we are, they wouldn't have survived because they would have destroyed themselves. We live on the brink of annihilation every second of every day. In fact, I'm surprised that we're still here. 1,000 nuclear weapons dropping on 100 cities could cause nuclear winter and the end of life on Earth. That's what could happen tonight. And in fact, we got 10 seconds from such an event in 1995 when Yeltsin got to within 10 seconds of pressing his button. There are 40 H-bombs targeted on New York City alone, let alone about 60 on Washington and probably up to 100 on Moscow. Um, and yet everyone's talking about terrorism. Um, the Russian early warning system is dilapidated and in fact the Russians are terrified they're going to destroy America by accident. I've got a colonel uh, from the Russian Missile Air Force who is 
desperate. He said, Helen, we're scared stiff. We're going to blow you all up by accident. The US now is the only country in the world not to have ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The Non-Proliferation Treaty says that in Article 6, the nuclear powers will disarm as quickly as they can. Now, so what the Stockpile Stewardship and Maintenance Program does is violate and directly contravene Article 6 because America is building up to 450 new hydrogen bombs a year. How dare they when the Cold War is over? Well, it was never justified when the Cold War was on, let alone now. It's evil intent. And it was Einstein who said the splitting of the atom changed everything save man's mode of thinking. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. And it was a very creative time. There was this huge flurry of sign building going on in the at that time. There were other people also in the park and there was a little village being built. It was sign alley up and down the, <coughs> the park, you know, the cent center of the park and the edge of the park. And it was very lively and, and music, there was lots of music and, and people were there around the clock and it got kind of like a carnival atmosphere sort of. It was, it was quite delightful. Being out there in the park, you run the gamut of human emotions. Some people hug you. I'm going to make an obscene gesture. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. You're welcome. Uh, some people slug you. So you're, you're a fucking idiot. I've been punched out a couple of times, at least a couple of times. But I think the biggest problem really is the police. But again, it's sort of kind of funny because I, on, on numerous occasions I've had policemen arrest me one day and then come back the next day and apologize. Oh, gee, Mr. Thomas, we wouldn't have, been, we wouldn't have done that except uh, we were following orders. Which is where I got the sneaky suspicion that there might be some kind of conspiracy going on or something. You know? Until I joined the vigil, my experience with police was basically to flirt with them. Um, but after I joined the vigil, I had a rude awakening because I discovered that uh, as long as, you know, you're an ordinary looking, ordinary acting citizen, then they like to flirt. But if you're somebody who looks a little different or acts a little different, then, then they don't feel so comfortable with you anymore. And my first experience with a police officer was to, was to be kicked awake by a police officer who came rushing in with a club. And uh, he was just really violent with a whole lot of people. And I had my camera and, and was taking pictures. And he, he saw what I was doing and he turned on me and kicked the camera away from me and threw me to the ground and stood on me. And we, there were a bunch of us arrested. I made friends with a lot of police over the years. They'd stop and talk. But when they got orders, then they'd come and arrest. The, there was this desire by the White House, implemented by the Department of Interior, to rid Lafayette Park of its uh, rodents and other scum. <laughs> So they wrote lots of regulations to try to get, to get us out of there, and uh, the one that was the most effective was the no camping regulation. Lafayette Park is a, a people park. It's a park to sit out, enjoy the sun, to eat your lunch, watch the birds, look at the White House, observe traffic going by. You can visit the park, you can uh, be in the park, you can enjoy the park, but you cannot live in the park. The park was not designed uh, for any type of camping. And so I ended up going to prison in 1988 for uh, camping. But we got arrested for allegedly camping, which we weren't doing uh, at all.
Judge Charles Ritchie uh, originally ruled in our favor because we filed motions to acquit us on the grounds that we were exercising our religious beliefs under the First Amendment. Several weeks later, this cop comes up on his little motor scooter and he says, uh, that was pretty clever, Mr. Thomas. I said, what? He said that motion. I said, no, that wasn't clever. I was, I was just telling the truth. He said, no, that was pretty clever. But I'll tell you what, you're not going to get away with that again. Uh, some of his colleagues cornered Judge Ritchie in the uh, cafeteria and straightened him out on that. And then the Court of Appeals reversed him and said he had to take us to trial. We got convicted by Judge Ritchie. And then at the end he said, my hands are tied. I know your cause is noble. And I know you're going to come right back out here and do what you're going, what you've been doing is when you come out. But we hope that by sending you to prison, it will deter others from adopting your lifestyle. Stop! Stop in the name of peace, in the name of God! Stop! And so there were several of us who went to prison for two months, and Thomas and I went for three months. For a long time, the, the judges, even if they convicted us, which often they wouldn't, would refuse to send us to jail. But after Judge Ritchie sent us to prison in 1988, then we started losing in various ways. We've been grandfathered or grandmothered into Lafayette Park. We're the token demonstrators that are allowed to stay. There's a lot of other people who try to do what we do and are, are made to leave or arrested. And for most people, being arrested is enough for them not to want to be arrested again and they would leave. There was an order that came down from uh, one of the judges to the, to the Department of Interior saying, um, why are you wasting our time? these people aren't doing anything wrong. And he said that uh, they had been told that, that it had cost them a million dollars or something like that to try to get us out of the park. <laughs> the reason that we are tolerated now is simply because it was too expensive <laughs> to fight us. The Washington Monument tonight, still under siege. A strange and frightening drama continues to unfold at the Washington Monument. It was a bizarre episode from the start. A man in a jumpsuit and a motorcycle helmet threatening to blow up the Washington Monument, apparently in the name of nuclear peace. The tense standoff drags on throughout the afternoon. The man behind the mask insisted on talking only with reporters and Associated Press writer Steve Comerow made several trips up the hill under a white handkerchief. Well, I was real nervous the first time going up and I was wearing a, this old green ski jacket I had because it was chilly and he made me open up my coat and turn around and make sure I wasn't armed. Well, I remember it was a long day. I went back and forth and back and forth uh, bringing his messages. Uh, back to the police and bringing their messages to him. He had driven a van up to the Washington Monument and was saying that it was filled with dynamite and he was going to blow it up unless the media broadcast his proposal. A list of demands was finally released and read by a police spokesman. Among them, a national dialogue on nuclear weapons and that TV stations must broadcast the dialogue daily. An anti-nuclear book called Fate of the Earth is to be used as some sort of guide, and the author of the book warns, because we now have the ability to destroy life itself, we have a moral imperative to achieve nuclear disarmament. He reinstated that we needed to make those arrangements immediately if we didn't want this detonated. There was no chance that he was going to blow down the Washington Monument as he threatened to do. Uh, the, Washington Monument is a big, heavy thing with walls, you know, as thick as a room. 
to my best recollection, I remembered when I used to work there as a footman, I could recall that there were the monument 555 feet and the walls were 15 foot thick. And a bomb outside of it is just not going to blow it down. I mean, unless it's a nuclear bomb or something, ironically. So they weren't worried about that. Um, what they were worried about at first was there were people inside of the monument, tourists and a park uh, ranger type. So my concern was what technique or strategy can we use to coax him or convince him to uh, let the hostages go free. Camaro meets again and again with Mayer, trying to gain his confidence. I was like trying to change the subject. I was trying to get him to talk about himself. And this is one of the techniques that the police suggested. But he just wouldn't go there. He wanted to talk about the nuclear freeze movement. This was obviously his uh, reason to live. That, you know, at first, we wanted to be sure they knew who he was. We didn't know because he had this motorcycle helmet and visor, so you couldn't really view who had all of this on. Later in the day, after negotiation, a member that demonstrated with him in front of the White House had seen this uh, incident on television. My friend is watching the TV, and uh, he said, look at this, look at this. I said, what? He said, somebody is at the Washington Monument, and they're gonna blow it up. I said, Oh yeah? And I did go back out and started painting the signs again until it occurred to me, shit, he's down there all by himself. You know, I, I can't just leave him there. So I ran all the way down there. And I knew all the cops and he knew me. And he said, oh, Mr. Thomas, so glad to see you. Come on, we gotta talk to this guy. And he came over and requested of us if he could go up and talk to Norman Mayer. And uh, we said, well, we think it's him, but we don't know for sure. And I said, I I'm just going to stand over here on the side, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Let's stand on the side. So uh, I just walked through their perimeter. I mean, they got these guys with guns all around, but they're like 20 feet away from each other, you know? So I just walked through them. And, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, come back, come back. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll be right back just a second. I got to talk to this guy. So, uh, you know, they're afraid to do anything. So anyway, I went up and he said, uh, no, this isn't your shtick, this is my shtick. Your thing is to stay in front of the White House. As long as you're there, they can't totally ignore their insanity. And so you got to stay there. I'm doing this. Till he came back, we were not able to validate that we were in fact dealing with Nor uh, Norman Mayer but there was also uh, an effort to figure out exactly how he was operating. I go back down the hill and the cops jump on me. Does he have any dynamite? I said, I don't know, I couldn't see inside the truck. Well, do you think he does? I said, I don't know. With the binoculars and the capability that we had, we could not identify the electronic uh, instrument he was saying that he had a, a remote control that he could detonate the dynamite. So the police wanted me to, to get close enough to him to identify the remote control, exactly what type it was, and then they would have a chance to jam it. And as a result of that, we were able to identify the, uh, the instrument as a Fataba. It's a uh, remote control used usually for model airplanes. That can detonate dynamite or any other explosive and had been used in the past. And they were trying to figure that out. I don't know how far they got with that exactly. He happened to have a small TV, Norman did, so he was able to validate that we were following his request. So he agreed to let them go. The negotiations resulted in the release five hours after the siege started of the nine people at the top of the monument. I just couldn't wait for it to be over and I remember I it was the last one out, and I was just thinking, this is almost over. Just, you're almost there. And they, they filed out, and uh, that was gratifying to me, you know, that we were able to get that done, and then it was just sort of me and him. I was much relieved as the chief, because I knew at least the uh, hostages were safe. But still, I had a critical situation. Mayor still holds his finger on the detonator. If he detonated, 
the dynamite and it went off, I mean, we were concerned about the damage or missiles that could go even to the White House. Police blocked off the area, snarling traffic. At sunset, workers and holiday shoppers were still trying to get home, making the rush hour even more of a misery than usual. Late afternoon passes. Night falls. It appears the negotiators and everyone else involved are in for a long night. The National Weather Service says the temperature tonight will go down to about 32 degrees. Whoever this man is at the Washington Monument, apparently he's prepared to stay for a while. After his last conversation with that reporter from the Associated Press, he said, see you tomorrow. The Academic and Strategic Alliance program involves many universities in this country and training foreigners to develop and understand and comprehend nuclear weapons. Why on earth they're doing it, God only knows. One of the reasons is because they're losing people to develop nuclear weapons because the old fellows who did it years ago in the Manhattan Project, they're dying out. They've trained a few more, but it's sort of not sexy anymore. So they, they therefore are allocating large amounts of money to universities, University of Chicago and you know, the universities that are training our children to earn a living to teach them how to make nuclear bombs to kill themselves. Um, and I see that program as absolutely contraindicated in terms of education of our children and to allow foreign citizens like Pakistanis and Indians and the like, to learn the techniques to make nuclear weapons just fosters lateral proliferation of nuclear weapons and hence it is more likely that the world will end in one nuclear war. With the Cold War being over, the threat of nuclear weapons still hangs over us like a dark mushroom cloud. And while my colleagues, our colleagues, are taking care of building more nuclear weapons, I'm pleased to be signing on as a co-sponsor of Delegate Norton's uh, Nuclear Disarmament and Economic Conversion Act of 1999. And if it doesn't pass this year, I'll sign on at the next Congress and the next Congress and the next Congress until it will. And I ask the question constantly, is this the world we want our children to live in? If we are serious about taking care of our children, we must start by eliminating nuclear weapons and leaving behind a legacy of peace, not fear. And we must do it now. Proposition 1 is uh, something that I got involved with virtually because of kids. During the, during the springtime, there's lots of class trips to Washington, D.C., where the high school kids come down. And a lot of kids would say to me, well, what you're doing is pretty cool, but if you really want to make change, you have to work within the system. Well, I don't believe in the system, but I figured you can't leave any stone unturned. For the first few years, we passed out a lot of flyers talking about what it was that we wanted to achieve, but there didn't seem to be any particular vehicle for getting there. In 1986, a person by the name of Dr. Charles Hyder came to Lafayette Park to fast for global nuclear disarmament, and he was a very large astrogeophysicist from New Mexico. And he was on a fast for a very, very long time, and he lost a huge amount of weight. And during that time, a lot of people became quite interested in what was going on in, in the park because he had credentials and he had friends. And his friends were pretty good at, uh, at popularizing or telling people about what was going on. And so we sat down together and drafted 
a petition to Congress calling for a constitutional amendment for global nuclear disarmament. And it was called the Hyder Amendment. Uh, when Dr. Hyder's fast ended and he left uh, and went back to New Mexico, we continued circulating the petition. And it was extremely popular. So that was when the idea of Proposition 1 was born. I came up with this idea to do this uh, initiative here in D.C. And what they did was classically what America is all about. They sat down and, without going to a bunch of experts, they wrote out what they wanted the people to vote on. In 1991, actually, we went through the process of filing the application and, and argued with the lawyer who said it wasn't an appropriate thing to bring to the voters. And we had a lawyer who argued on our behalf and won, and they issued us the petitions and we were going to start our campaign, and then the first Gulf War st started. So we, we dropped that particular campaign and we devoted 40 days and 40 nights to beating on drums and fighting the war in Iraq, along with a lot of other people. And then once that was over, then we started the process again, and we brought the idea to the voters finally in 1993 as Initiative 37, and won the election with 56% of the vote. We won, overwhelmingly, despite the fact that we did it on $600. The Washington Post, the Washington Times, and just about every news channel trashed us. So we won the election, and uh, Congresswoman Norton met with us. But Eleanor Holmes Norton began opposed to the idea. When I look closely at it, I'm a constitutional lawyer, and I saw that it was for a constitutional amendment. Now, we don't want constitutional amendments except for matters involving overarching issues, mostly matters involving our rights. After the election, she compromised. We compromised, she compromised. And together, we worked out the present bill. And so we got the Nuclear Disarmament Economic Conversion Act. It calls on the United States government to promise the world, we'll get rid of all our nuclear weapons if everybody else does. To convert its uh, nuclear weapons uh, and their cost to domestic needs. Including health care and housing and education and food and environmental restoration and in recent years it has a clause saying uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, I put in the first bill in 1994 I believe and every two years since. And citizens really need to understand that the fact that a bill doesn't get out of committee doesn't mean very much. Uh, that doesn't mean the democracy has failed. What my citizens have done is look for openings. They don't claim that they've captured the imagination of uh, the country or, or certainly not of the world, but they do know that somebody has to sound the alarm and that alarms are usually not sounded by mass movements. Alarms are sounded by small movements which then become mass movements. And the rest is, if not history, we think history in the making. He is still there, pacing the grounds around the 555-foot monument as he has all day long. All of his threats have been delivered in even measured tones. Since about 9.30 this morning, a man saying he wants a national dialogue on avoiding nuclear war has threatened to blow up the monument. Mayor is demanding that the U.S. government and all other governments disarm. Spotlights illuminate the monument. Tensions rise. Police and FBI agents have been conducting indirect negotiations thus far with limited effect. As you can see, it is now dark here in Washington and the stalemate continues. 
during the negotiation period, he would afterwards go back, sometimes to the back of the end of the vehicle, and look like he was talking to someone. And another time, he did that from the driver's side, like he was talking to someone, looking into the vehicle. The cops jump on me. Is there anybody with him? I said, I don't know. He, he did say he was communicating with the truck. Communicating with the truck? I said, yeah, this sounds a little strange, doesn't it? So we thought, assuredly, that he had an accomplice in the back of the vehicle. The last meeting that uh, Steve Kamara had with him in negotiating, he said he didn't want to talk anymore, that uh, he wanted to see if we were going to keep our promises with the newspaper and the media, and that he would get back with us in the morning. So we're kind of settling down for the evening. Uh, I didn't know if he'd want to talk to me again or anything else, but the police wanted me to stay. And uh, it was getting dark. And the evening newscasts were pretty much wrapped up. And he got crankier late in the day. He had, he had the radio in the truck and stuff, so he was aware of, of the news reporting. And I think he was unhappy that the issue was him and the siege and the issue wasn't nuclear freeze. It appeared to some that he watched the evening news on a portable TV set, and a few minutes after the news was over, he began to back his truck away from the monument. I used the football field concept, and I said to the snipers that if he starts moving, he will not reach the 50-yard line. When the truck began to move toward downtown Washington and the White House, it was then that the shooting began. Police snipers with night scopes opened fire. Mayor is hit in a hail of bullets. The truck overturns. It was a little confusing. It was hard to figure out what had happened at first, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't looking at him at the time. I was in the, in the hut at the bottom of the hill. And uh, I went rushing outside. There was a report that possibly another man had escaped from the van and ran into the Washington Monument. So we were still concerned that that guy had explosives on him with a backpack and he in fact could still explode the dynamite. Tear gas was fired into the Washington Monument in a step-by-step -step search for a second man. But there was no one else. Norman Mayer acted on his own. But we still didn't know if um, if there were any explosives there or not. The dogs were sent up to the truck to sniff it for bombs and one of them had a positive result and of course that got everybody nervous. The SWAT team inches closer in an armored personnel carrier. Then Major Ron Miller and his men move in cautiously on foot. One of our counter sniper people could report with their telescopic lens that uh, it did appear that Mr. Mayor was still alive. I approached the driver's side. I grabbed uh, his hand because it looked like he could reach the transmitter. While I was with Mr. Mayor, he said uh, two different times, uh, they shot me in the head, they shot me in the head. Norman Mayer dies moments later. His truck is empty. It is all a bluff. The siege is over at the Washington Monument. Nuclear reactors were first designed to fission uranium to make plutonium. When you put uranium in a nuclear reactor and it fission, spontaneously it produces 200 new radioactive elements. Um, they're potent carcinogens, huge quantities of liquid, high level, devastatingly dangerous, toxic radioactive waste now exists mostly at Hanford, Washington, and in Savannah River, South Carolina. And as these radioactive materials, all of them migrate, they bioconcentrate thousands of times at each step of the food chain, the algae, the crustaceans, the little fish, the big fish, the lobsters, and us. Now it's still being produced for bombs. They don't know what to do with it. They say that they can store it safely. They are kidding themselves. They are lying. It's just a biological and medical catastrophe which will be bequeathed by us to all our descendants for the rest of time. That's what making the bombs means. So we made the bombs to kill ourselves, to kill ourselves better.
My name is Kathy Cashel and I was in a band called Norman Mayer Group through the late 90s. Norman Mayer Group did two pretty serious um, whole country tours and it was pretty great. I grew up in the DC area and I was in high school when he was killed and um, it, it clearly made an impression on me. You know, activists and musicians to me are very peas in a pod. Um, and not always the most mentally stable people in the world. Um, and I just have a lot of affection for him. This was the Reagan era, you know, this was really like, it really felt like we could all blow up in the nuclear war. And particularly growing up in the DC area, I just kind of assumed that I was going to die in the nuclear war. But when I was a little kid, how do you deal with mortality anyway? But when you can reach out and hold it, you know what I mean? When it's such a clear possibility and it's got such a face on it, um, it seems like that's a that's a you know that's a Norman Mayer thing. Um, it seems like that it could drive you crazy. It could really drive you crazy. <laughs> you know, you don't, it's like you want peace as you're threatening to blow things up. This is really not the successful. It's like every major spiritual tradition in the world is telling you that this is not a profitable path to go down, and yet tons of activists are doing it. And I think it's really clear why is because. Righteous anger is an incredibly intoxicating thing. Um, and it's, you know, whatever it is that you get to stand up front and tell people what's what. You get to stand up front and tell people what's what. I've been picking up the bread from Firehook Bakeries uh, for about 10 years and distributing the bread and the pastries to the Central Union Mission and La Casa Men's Shelter and uh, Rachel's Women's Center and Bread for the City and a, a variety of different places. And the, the way that we got into this was basically we don't spend money for food. We uh, have always pretty much eaten what comes our way and a number of years ago a friend of ours went up to the people at, the, at one Firehook Bakery and asked if they would like to donate their food to the homeless and they said yes so we started picking it up and uh, back in those days we didn't have a van and we didn't have a big house you know and we spent most of our time in front of the White House and so we would pick it up from one bakery and take it back out to the park and uh, get what we needed for ourselves but uh, give the rest of it away but we figured once we were able to transport it to the shelters it was going a lot further that way I, we, we feed several hundred people, keep them fed. There is a huge amount of bread and pastries, and, so, and we pick that up at well, six days a week. So The shelters know that they can count on us to provide them with bread, and they appreciate it. I thought about teaching when I was young, but I was terrified of speaking in public. So I bring you greetings from our relatives across the sea, from the Peace Park anti-nuclear vigilers, of whom I am one. Let's make nuclear disarmament the law. 187 countries have promised to abolish nuclear weapons, but they haven't set a date. Our purpose here is to make it happen, to make global nuclear disarmament the law. Eighty-one. In 1995, Congresswoman Norton wrote a letter to the World Court during the time that the World Court was deliberating on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, asking them to take note that the United States 
Congress was considering a bill for global nuclear disarmament, and I was uh, sent there by friends to present this to the World Card however I could, which happened through Zimbabwe. As a result of the World Court finding that the threat of use of nuclear weapons is illegal, even though they have no way of enforcing it, nevertheless it brings the idea up to a higher level of awareness among all of the, all of the diplomats. The rest of the world understands it. They do understand it. It was a strange chapter in the history of the nation's capital, the Washington Monument held hostage. It ended last night when four police bullets hit an anti-nuclear war protester as he drove off in what appeared to be a kind of rolling time bomb. He was bluffing. Norman Mayer, a 66-year-old handyman, galvanized the city by holding the Washington Monument hostage with a toy and an empty truck. Mayer was shot to death in the process. You know, the story ended so tragically because he, he, he obviously wasn't listening to the police. He tried to drive away. They, they shot him. A bullet hole in the marble-faced granite, a broken flagpole, and a notice at the entrance. The only signs left for tourists to point to of the monument siege. It was a bluff, an empty threat. When the truck pulled up to the monument, there was no TNT inside. The Washington Monument was closed this morning so that cleanup crews and souvenir hunters could clear away the remainders of last night's fatal incident. But far more difficult to clear away were the questions surrounding the shooting of Norman Mayer. When I'm talking to Lindsay, this guy in fatigues comes running up, snaps his heels, just like a Nazi. You know. sir, sir, the march were in place and ready, sir! <clears throat> pivots on his heel and goes running back off. This is like 9 o'clock in the morning. So they had this in, in the works well before. And then the police coming again from the back on the secret service. Well, he's dead. But I don't really, I don't really question the police. <laughs> Start to laughing. I said, who is dead? Well, he was not going to give you any more papers to distribute. They knew. So I think they, they were shooting to stop him. I think they shot him in the head four times, and uh, once in the shoulder. I don't know. I, I hope they didn't give that guy a medal. Um, the park police here seem really trigger happy anyway. I, I, I don't know that they were shooting to kill him. The official story was that they were aiming for his tires. The truck was the target. Not the man. Not the man. It's so clear it could have ended you know, a hundred different ways where he would have lived. It turned out there was nothing dangerous in the truck. I mean, they should have been able to tell because the truck was empty. You know, I mean, if he had a ton of dynamite, it would have been running a little lower. That particular truck that he owns, he lined it with steel to make sure that it would withstand uh, a nuclear blast. We, uh, in searching the vehicle, discovered that he had a uh, steel plate welded to the vehicle so that uh, the people that are so-called experts in vehicle displacement advised us that he could, in fact, have approximately 1,000 pounds of weight in that vehicle. Number two, we had uh, were able to validate that he had tried to purchase uh, dynamite in the state of Kentucky. This guy had been very meticulous in doing everything to thoroughly convince us. So Norman Mayer had carried everything out just as if he had been our director of a movie. There was no way you could have arrived in any other decision. If he left the monument grounds, then I really would have had a mobile time bomb.
remember him being buried there. I can't speak for others. It certainly didn't bother me at all. A, a, a veteran should have a right to be buried at Arlington, uh, regardless of whether in later life uh, he or she has uh, no longer followed the normal rules. I don't think it was right. That's just a personal opinion of my own. I don't think he should have been buried there with all those other patriots. I spent four years in the Marine Corps, uh, one year in Vietnam. Being a combat veteran, I guess personally, I have a feeling of ambivalence. One side of me, that I wished he hadn't been buried there. But the other side, the rational side, when I think about who would I be to have him refuse his own constitutional right when I spent 30 some years defending the Constitution and people's rights. I would be a big hypocrite. I've thought about him a lot over the, over the years. It was just odd for me because since I, I knew the guy, uh, I called the police and I might, must have gotten on the police scanner or something and so uh, all these reporters started to call me. He was, he was holding the, the Washington Monument hostage all day long. It was actually still happening that night uh, when Nightline went on, which is what I was on. I was actually sitting next to Marion Barry. And I was, I don't know what I was, uh, 21 years old. I probably looked 16. And the mayor of Washington turned to me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I explained and I, you know, Ted Koppel asked me the questions and I answered them um, and just told people how I knew. Uh, Norman Mayer, uh, but it ended up uh, actually getting me my first real job in Washington, D.C. because uh, my local congressman had seen it and said, and I applied for a job, he said, well, you did well on that, so you can come work for me uh, as well. So I guess I owe Norman uh, an awful lot. I haven't gone back to the monument since, well, not back inside. Um, I don't know if it's an aversion or something, but I, I haven't. It has sort of, it does bring back some memories. You know, it's just such an odd thing. People people tended to remember this jacket I was wearing, at least my friends did and, and relatives, because uh, every time I walked up there, he would make me open my jacket like this to see if uh, the police had given me a weapon or something like that. You know, it's it's kind of green. So, <laughs> you know, as you, as you get older, you don't wear these colors quite so bright, I guess. It's kind of a funny thing, but I, you know, it was sort of squirreled away, but I still have it. I can't bring myself to throw it out. I still have a picture, a mugshot of Norman Mayer in my rear dresser. Any law enforcement officer that takes a life will impact you for the rest of your life. It's never the same. You are a different person. That's something that I had to do. It's a decision I had to make. And uh, I think, you know, that as an accountable person, I didn't have any other choice. I have to rationalize and justify that in my mind. Otherwise, uh, you know, you couldn't live with yourself. Maybe Norman Mayer never had a chance to be heard, given his criminal record, his arrests for drug, prowling, assault, and battery. Maybe he became a criminal because he couldn't be heard. We'll never know, and it doesn't really matter. What matters is that he wanted to tell us that humanity is drifting toward nuclear war. Perhaps this is a cry only lunatics and outlaws can hear. It would not be the first time truth had failed to get the establishment to listen, or the foolish had been chosen to confound the wise. 
The wise yesterday were rattling their sabers in Moscow or putting the finishing touches in the House of Representatives on a military budget of $231 billion for the coming year. $231 billion, including over $2 billion to continue research on the MX missile they had symbolically voted against the day before. This is the wisdom of the world which proved too much for Norman Mayer, who wanted only to stop the arms race. Once you realize the futility of your cause, you can choose to live as a zombie, a martyr, a cynic, or a saint, or today, a video terrorist. Norman Mayer chose to go out that way. It doesn't appear he really had the stomach for it. Those detonators had nothing to detonate. So he played Atari on the monument grounds and died when the game was over. Lunacy? Yes. But it is the lunacy of nations today who hold the world hostage, as he did Washington, with the threat of violence for the sake of peace. This sad little man had the superpowers for a role model. He died unheeded by them, but the star of his own television special. Such was the final lunacy. His pathetic charade received far more time from the media than we'll give the dialogue on nuclear issues, which he was crazy enough to think we might honor. When I think of uh, Bill Thomas and Concepcion, what they do and what they've done all these years, you'd have to think, well, those people are nuts. They're crazy. Well, if you think about it, police officers are almost total psychotics in other people's estimation. Because when there's danger, most people run away from it, where we run toward it. It's not easy to stand down there and walk and demonstrate and withstand the heat, the rain, the coal, how many people could endure something like that, even if it was a, a paid job? A lot of times people come by and ask me whether I think I'm making any difference. There have been lots of people who have come up to us and said, what are you achieving? How, how, how can you get anything done here? Why don't you go get a job? Why don't you do something from the inside? Uh, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, I think I'm making a difference. There are three million people who come to see Lafayette Park each year, according to the National Park Service. And, of course, we don't talk to three million people, but a lot of them see the signs. And we talk to a lot of people. So I think it's very effective. You know, if you, for somebody who has no money, how else are you going to advertise? How else are you going to get your point across? I, I believe that if the vigil were to disappear, it would be a great tragedy because it brings hope to people. And I've been told that so many times. But also, we have educated people. We've shared information with people that they wouldn't otherwise get. And we've been able to promote Proposition 1 with people from all over the country and all over the world. Proposition will never become a piece of legislation until we educate the Joe Sixpacks out in America and the Mrs. Joe Sixpacks when they know what danger they're under with the weapons facing off against each other between Russia and America. That's when Proposition 1 will happen. It will never happen without having the people behind it. Never. The anti-nuclear White House people who stand out there, rain, shine, snow and freezing, and they've been there for many years. My heart goes out to them. They're true and noble heroes of this country. Their time will come. They should make a statue of them. Put it in front of the White House. Tourists come to D.C. to learn about the country, and they're kind of part of history now. You know, if anybody deserves a place in heaven, that would be my mom. She's a very kind, strong woman who has really deep principles. She loves the world and wants to make it a better place. Thomas and Concepcion are, are very unique individuals. They are the strongest and most stubborn people I ever met. I have the deepest love and respect for Concepcion. And Thomas, of course, is my other half. And I'm incomplete without him. He lives, he, he breathes what he believes in. That, that, that's what spurns him on. That's, and, and that's why he will continue to do what he's doing, uh, you know, even if the last nuclear arm in the world is destroyed. Uh, he's, he's not going to move. He'll be there. I think that we're on a razor's edge. There are some real bad people, but they're few. And if we stop working for them, and we stop listening to them, then 
humanity will make it. What I fear the most is that people won't wake up and realize that everybody on Earth is our family. <laughs>